When you go through many of the favorite foods of people today, it's hard not to notice the importance of a single ingredient in nearly all of them. Cheese. In fact, it often gets inserted into pretty much everything nowadays. Such a staple commodity, it's hard to imagine the days before the invention of this commodity, or that it was likely found completely by accident. In today's video, we're digging into the origins of cheese and attempting to make a few different results starting from a freshly milked goat. Let's see if we can master the art of rotting milk and not poisoning ourselves on the way. Everything we use comes from 8,000 generations of collective innovation and discovery. But could an average person figure it all out themselves and work their way from the Stone Age to today? That's the question we're exploring. Each week, I try to take the next step forward in human history. My name is Andy, and this is How to Make Everything. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next step in this journey. Today's video is sponsored by Keeps, hair loss treatment for men. Two out of three guys will experience male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. If that's something you're concerned about, then you might be interested in today's sponsor. Keeps offers the only two FDA approved hair loss treatments out there. It has more five star reviews than any of its competitors. Getting and using it is really simple. You just visit a doctor online and get it delivered straight to your home. They make it easy and deliver your medication every three months so you can say goodbye to pharmacy checkout lines and awkward doctor visits. Keeps treatment typically takes between four to six months to see results so it's important to act fast. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. The best way to prevent baldness is to combat it while you still have hair. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com HTME or click the link in the description and receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash H-T-M-E. During the very first project that launched this series several years ago, making a sandwich entirely from scratch, I first dabbled in the cheese making process to make a very simple mozzarella for my sandwich, which was likely one of the main culprits for it not tasting the greatest. Not bad. Since then, I've been curious about digging deeper into the cheese making process to learn a better understanding of this ancient art. But needing to head out of town for some other upcoming projects, I let Lauren take the lead on this one. Dating well over 7,000 years ago, cheese is believed to likely have been invented completely by accident by the use of animal stomachs as a storage device. A common way to store liquids was using the stomach bladder of slaughtered animals. When milk was stored inside the stomachs of certain animals, it gets exposed to a collection of enzymes the animal had used to break down and digest milk called rennet. The reaction of rennet to milk is one of the key processes of separating milk into curds for cheese making. Once this result was noticed, it was likely exploited to allow milk to be turned into a less perishable commodity. Cheese making spread to many parts of the world and developed into countless unique forms of cheese we eat today. Let's see if we can make a few of these different forms of cheese ourselves. First up, let's get some milk. Buddies! Hi guys! How are we today? <laughs> You want the pets? <laughs> He's eating my shirt. <laughs> yeah, we'll chew on anything we can get a hold of. They're trying to eat the corn dog off my leg. <laughs> I'm Morgan Allen, and this is our farm. It's a small commercial goat dairy. We sell our milk to Singing Hills, which makes cheese. And we also have a small side business called Saucy Goat Caramel. This breed, they're called Oberhasli. And these, I call them the babies, but they're not really babies anymore. They're like six months old. And then my milking goats are in the big barn, so <laughs> he sneezed on me. Some of them have a little bit of a cold, and they're just really busy, like to chew on things. We feed um, just good grass, alfalfa, mixed hay, and yeah. then a grain mix that's formulated for goats. So, and then they eat a little bit of grass, but not much. They prefer like tree branches and oh. bark and weeds. They like, seem to like to chew on my shirt. I know like goats are super like stereotypical, like eating like tin cans and stuff. They just like to chew on stuff. They do like paper, so okay. <laughs> goat um, ate my homework. Like, yeah, kind of, they're just really curious, I guess is the right word. Do they have teeth? They do, yeah. They only have teeth on the bottom, okay. so the front of their upper mouth has no teeth. Yeah. Um, in the back, they have teeth both on the top and bottom. Yeah, I felt it when it was chewing on my hand. I didn't yep. feel um, as if I was in danger. <laughs> so they're really friendly. We bottle feed all the girls, so that's why they're so obnoxiously friendly. They are so sweet. So you guys make caramels out of the milk? We make caramel sauce. The cheesemaker can't use all the meat that we produce. Oh. <laughs> Just a little sneeze, no big deal. <laughs> You're being rude. They kind of all have their babies at once, which means they all give a lot of milk in the spring. And then this time of year, they start reducing in their production. But the, at that peak in the spring, we have a lot of extra milk. So you milk them at 5.30 in the morning and 5.30 in the evening, every day. In the barn here, this old barn, that's where the moms are. We can walk in there. Yeah, so here's the adult does. So the girls are called does and the males are called bucks. Hi. 
How are we today? <laughs> All right, so I've never milked a goat before. Is it the same as milking a cow? Yeah, it's gonna be pretty much exactly okay. the same. And you just do the same as you do with a cow. Like, just start at the top and then squeeze down. Okay, perfect. Well, I'm an expert at that, so don't worry. Good. I will treat her well. Yeah. <laughs> hey, girls. How do you tell who's who? They all look a little bit different. And then they kind of all have different color collars on. I'm thinking she'll stand good and be easy to milk. We'll let her poop before she comes out. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Can you get up here, hon? From the feet Whoops, fresh delivery of the goods. Hi, baby. Ooh, that's the good stuff. <laughs> Look at your little bowl. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> May I please have some milk? Oh, <gasps> it worked. I did it the first time. Everyone saw it. Whoa, okay. Yeah, somewhat of an expert. Pretty good. Oh, damn it, now I bragged. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Oh, oh. oh my bucket! <laughs> <laughs> this is like definitely way easier. Oh, we'll kick. Oops, oh, sorry, I got her on the foot. All right, Andy, you want to turn? Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, are you going double? Making me look bad? Now, with the milk, the first step for cheese making is called acidification. This can be done by adding an outside acid, such as vinegar or citric acid, or it can be achieved with the fermentation of the lactic milk sugars in the milk into lactic acid. Today, this is often done with a starter culture that allows better control. But to do it from scratch, you just need to leave some of the goat milk out so that it can naturally begin to ferment by naturally present bacteria. Depending on the temperature you allow the milk to ferment, you can potentially get different types of lactic acid that will produce different types of cheeses. A temperature around room temperature propagates mesophilic bacteria, and a slightly elevated temperature produces thermophilic bacteria. While we let some of the milk ferment, let's get the ingredients needed for the second step, coagulation. For that, we'll need the rennet. In place of having to butcher and extract the stomach lining of a still nursing calf, there are multiple options of plants that produce the same rennet enzymes themselves. Okay, so we found some wild thistle, and this is what we're going to use as the curdling agent for the goat's milk. So how this works is you wait until it goes from the purple flower to a little bit brown, and then that means it's ready to be plucked. And you just pull the middle out, and this is what we will dry out, and then crush down and add to the goat's milk, and it will make it curdle. Ooh, this is a good one. It's a little bit purple still. Ooh, this is a nice one. These look pretty okay. Mm, those are a little dead. Nope. So we've left this goat milk out for about four days now. It started to coagulate, but that's good because we wanted that. So this is now known as the mother culture. The next step in the acidification process is to add the mother culture to this big thing of goat milk that we have. Depending on the temperature of the goat milk, different lactobacteria will propagate in different temperatures. So this one's at about 90 degrees. A different one we're going to do is a little bit higher than that and they will result in different cheeses. And then it'll start to coagulate more, get the cheese. It's going. Cheese up. Cheese up! <laughs> All right, we're gonna see if anything happened overnight. Cheese. Whoa. It definitely smells like cheese now. Cheese. <laughs> To further encourage the coagulation process, we are now going to introduce the rennet. The rennet that we are using is thistle, thanks to our friend, Sticky. Hey! <laughs> if it weren't for Sticky, we would have to butcher a baby calf and use its stomach lining, as that's an alternate form of rennet. Yeah, that's okay, just take mine! Ah! So I'm going to crush the thistle in order to make the rennet. And once this is crushed, I'm going to add it to warm water let it steep for 10 minutes and then add it to our mother culture milk mixture. Okay, now I'm gonna add the rennet. I'm going to strain it as I add it so that there is not any thistle in our cheese. 
the addition of the rennet coagulates the milk into curds and whey. And then after I stir it in, we're going to let it sit for one hour. For one of the earliest forms of cheese and easiest to make, all you need to do is strain out the curds. So I'm gonna take it, pour it into the cloth, and the process is unique, and for this one, as you hang it up, the coagulate stays in the cheesecloth, but then the drippings just drip out. Since the curd is so fine, you don't want to squeeze it as it might go through the cloth. So that's where the dripping comes into play. And so my assistant's going to hold it for me for about two to four hours. Oh, it does not smell great, but that's feta. We did it. <laughs> Bountiful yield. <laughs> I will not be eating it. Due to personal reasons, I am scared to try this. <laughs> you want to eat it? We have a real future in the feta business, Andy. But for a second type of cheese with a little bit different type of texture, another batch of the milk was developed, but in a warmer environment, to try and get the thermophilic lactic bacteria to develop. Then the same rennet step was repeated, once again producing whey's and curds. Once the curd and whey is separated, a variety of additional steps can be applied to make different types of cheeses. Besides the type of milk you start with and the type of lactic bacteria propagated, many other factors can determine what type of cheese is produced. One of the biggest is the amount of moisture that's retained in the cheese. So as a contrast to the feta, I had Lauren try to make a more dried cheese like Romano. This is the basket I made. It's going to be used to separate the curds from the whey. Let's go. <laughs> Don't love that. The basket didn't work out super well, so Lauren improvised a simple cheese press to better strain and drain them. So now we are going to drain the curd and press the cheese into its final form. Put the lid on and apply pressure. So at first you start with a light pressure, but then eventually we're gonna introduce a five pound weight for five to six hours. Okay, so part of this is to take the cheese out of the mold during the five to six hour pressing process and turning it flip to make sure that different parts of it drain. Now I'm going to fold it, kind of cut it in half and give it an additional press and then leave it for a little bit longer. All right, so now we gotta dry this bad boy out. So we're gonna take it out of the mold, give it some time. Okay, this has been sitting out all night. Um, we're gonna do the brining. So this is a mixture of salt, water, and a little bit of vinegar. Gonna give her a little bath there. Love that. So we're gonna let that sit for about a half hour. All right, the cheese has been made. Our feta is gonna be the softer cheese and the Romano is a hard cheese, even though they kind of both got a little dried out, so they're both a little bit harder. In the spirit of all things fair, I'm going to make, I mean, let Andy try the cheese. I hope he likes it. All right, so while I was gone, Lauren made the cheese and uh, she wasn't quite brave enough to actually try it herself. She left it for me. Some Romano here. It's pretty good. I'd say that's pretty, pretty comparable to like a store-bought one. It obviously needs to dry over a longer period, so it's still like chewable. You should really grate a cheese like this when it's fully done. It was like really good. <laughs> I want to buy this. Calm down, Andy. <laughs> Cleanse the palate. All right, a little bit of mold is formed on there. We'll just remove that. Mmm, a really sharp taste to it. Much stronger than the Romano. It's really good. They both have a pretty distinct flavor from the goat cheese. This one seems like a bit sharper. There's a little bit of mold that has started to form on it. Might be adding a little bit extra flavor. It might be on the, on the process of accidentally turning it into blue cheese. You can kind of just do this on accident. 
uh, which is basically how it was discovered. We had a little bit of a struggle in the beginning, trying to get different cheeses to uh, ferment the right way. Really frustrating. I know Lauren got pretty frustrated, but the end result I think is surprisingly good. Pretty good. And thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. Without you, these videos won't be possible. If you want to see us make more videos, consider supporting us on Patreon. And uh, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.